action. It's sorry, just forgot it to start the recording. And here, what you see is stratification by age again. So the people who are over 75 represent the dark purple line. And you see we have these enormous numbers, and then it goes down, then it goes back up, then it goes down and back up. And these are linked to vaccinations. So we're getting some control, but now I assure you out here, out to the right, this is going to be going up and up and up and up until we figure out a way to stop the Omicron EA5 variant, which is really spreading around the world. So let's contrast viruses and prions. So at the top is the coronavirus prion over here. And in the middle and in the bottom panel are prions. So prions are these fibrils. They are aggregates of prions. They form amyloids. We'll talk about that much more. And you see that no two of these are alike. Each one is slightly different. One being, and they, they tend to grow out one place and then another and another and another. They're fragmented, but they're all infectious. And this is very different. If you've seen one virus, one coronavirus, you've seen them all, one polio virus, you've seen them all. So let's look at the spectrum of pathogens. There are prions, viruses, and viroids. Viroids are naked nucleic acids discovered by Ted Diener almost a half a century ago. Uh, bacteria, fungi. Uh, so examples, yeast infections, vaginal infections, valley fever like coccidiomycosis, and then parasites like malaria, uh, worms, ticks, fleas, lice. And there's an enormous variation here. And they're more different uh, path small pathogens uh, than, there are, uh, than there are planets uh, in our solar system uh, and beyond through the Milky Way. I mean, it's just an enormous number. Now that's that's scrapie of sheep, and the name comes scraping their fur off, and this is an advanced case of scrapie. Here's our people dying of kuru in Papua New Guinea in the 1950s, and all ages, predominantly in women, uh, a few men over to the left, and here a young boy. What was the cause of this? It was ritualistic cannibalism. When the, the, when the people died, the brains were taken and they were cooked and then people ate them, uh, but the cooking didn't kill all of the prions, which are resistant to heat and activation. The big leap intellectually came not from the people who were studying Kuru, Carlton Gajasek and Joe Gibbs, and earlier, uh, Vin Zegas, but it came from a veterinarian, Bill Hadlow. And Bill Hadlow was, at, was on sabbatical in England at the time. This is in the late 1950s. And he, would, he came from the Rocky Mountain Laboratory in the United States, in Montana. He looked at, a, at, at slides at a a big uh, gathering uh, in England, and he compared the slides of Kuru to the ones he was seeing all the time with Scrapie, which he had been studying for a long time. And he came to the conclusion that it might be very valuable to try to transmit Kuru into animals. And he thought that, well, non-human primates might be the best host. Uh, and he got it completely right. And what he suggested was exactly the right thing to do. And Carlton Gajasek and Joe Gibbs, who had been studying Kuru, did exactly those experiments. And they turned out to be positive. And this really launched the field. 
Now, my own work begins in 1972, and this comes from a Nobel Prize uh, piece that I wrote. And so I'm just going to read you a very short uh, piece from that. So in 1972, I began a residency at the University of California, San Francisco. And two months later, I admitted a female patient who was exhibiting progressive loss of memory and difficulty performing routine tasks. I was surprised to learn that she was dying of a slow virus infection called Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, which evoked no response from the body's defenses. Next, I learned that scientists were unsure if a virus, I've already said this, was really the cause of CJD, since the cause of infectious agent had some unusual properties. The amazing properties of the presumed causative slow virus, as it was called then, captivated my imagination. And I began to think that defining the molecular structure of this elusive agent might be a wonderful research project. The more that I read about CJD and the seemingly related diseases, Kuru of the Foray people of New Guinea and Scrapie of sheep, the more captivated I became. Some of the most interesting data available at that time on what the Scrapie agent might be was done by a woman named Tigva Alper and some collaborators. And other people had shown initially that the Scrapie agent was resistant to formalin. And then she showed it was resistant to activation by x-rays, yielding a very small target size of about 150,000 Daltons. And it was, she also showed that the Scrapie agent was very resistant to inactivate by UV light, arguing that it might be devoid of DNA or RNA. There were a lot of ideas about what the Scrapie agent might be. And here you have this enormous list, 24 different possibilities. Some of these overlapped. I won't read through them all, but uh, it's just to show you that there were lots and lots of ideas and there were papers corresponding to virtually all of these. So it was not just talk, it was all in print. So I wrote a book uh, in, published in 2014, and it summarizes all of this work and tries to make it a little more accessible. So I recommend this book to anybody who wants to pursue this further. So, and the key points throughout the book are that prions are proteins, they adopt alternative conformations, which are self-replicating. The discovery of prions was unexpected and as such provoked a firestorm of criticism and disbelief. Prions provoked a legion of naysayers. So I talk about the fact that mounting evidence, and it's still increasing, that many diseases, besides Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and the list goes on. But these are different prions, different proteins, different amino acid sequences that cause these other diseases. The big breakthrough came when we adapted the work of Richard Kimberlin and Richard Marsh, uh, who published a paper on hamster scrapie instead of mouse scrapie. And what and we were able to adapt this, this advance that they made because the animals would get sick in about 75 days when inoculated with a high titer inoculum. And what we found was that using the hamster, that we could accelerate our studies by a factor of 100. And using that advance in measurement, we now could develop a simple purification scheme in which we were able to ultimately isolate a single protein with high, high levels of infectivity. And now, because we had removed so much of the junk that was unimportant, we could then ask if procedures that alter nucleic acids decrease the infectivity. And we found that the answer was no. Uh, and if we looked at procedures that modify proteins, what happens? The answer was yes, there was inactivation. And this is a slide that simply shows this very graphically, that when we uh, tried to digest uh, all the nucleic acid, 
with zinc ions and sorol sorol and photoadducts and hydroxylamine, we decrease the infectivity. I'm sorry, we, it remained infectious, excuse me. And when we use diethyl pyrocarbonate, then we decrease the infectivity. But this is a chemical modification and we could reverse it with hydroxylamine and we could remove these ethoxyformal groups shown by the little open squares and the infectivity was restored. Meanwhile, the nucleic acids were continued to be modified first uh, with these, uh, <laughs> excuse me, with these ethoxyformal groups and then further modification with hydroxyl amine. Now, when we did the reverse and we looked for procedures that focused on destroying proteins such as proteases, we lost no inf we, we lost the infectivity. And with SDS, we denatured the proteins and we lost the infectivity. And with phenol, we also denatured the proteins and we lost the infectivity. But with nucleases and ultraviolet light, we saw the infectivity remain. So a friend of mine, uh, really through, and through my aunt, who was very good friends with uh, a woman whose husband was named Frank Westheimer, a brilliant chemist at Harvard. He came to UCSF and uh, spent a week as a visiting professor uh, in the School of Pharmacy. And I spoke to him at length, and I had met him many times before because my aunt and his wife had been friends since the age of three. Uh, and he said to me, Stan, you're going to discover something very fundamental here. When you have a little more information, you need to choose a name. You need to spend time doing this. It is important. If you don't dream up a good name, someone else will do it, and that person will get a disproportionate share of the credit. So I listened to this. I'd been working really hard for a long time on this problem, and I said, well, okay, I'll do that. All right, so I started. And I started with a whole list and I kept going and going and going. And I'm just gonna show you how this term evolved. So I incorporated protein, infectious and agent. This was a challenge. Soon I jettisoned agent because it wasn't important. It was too nonspecific and I focused on protein and infectious. So I joined PRO IN, which means, which is pronounced proin. Uh, and it's, it rhymed with loin. So now we were into sheep and other cuts of meat. Uh, but one day, and how many times I did this and rejected it before I finally said this might be a good idea, I have no idea. But I transposed the I and the O. And now I created prion or prion. Uh, and then I was excited about this. And I, so I immediately looked in the dictionary, but unfortunately there was a bird. And you could say that this was for the birds, so to speak. Everyone's supposed to be laughing now. Uh, and after thinking about it, I decided to generously share my discovery with the birds and pronounce P-R-I-O-N as prion for the infectious prion uh, and leave prion for the birds. Now, there are people who pronounce it prion, and I can't control that. When we finally, for the first time, saw uh, some, some physical entity, a protein, that was only present in the scrapey preparations of brains from infected animals, uh, we were able to now have a physical entity that we could look at. And here's the protein by itself. It's protease resistant. It's 27,000 to 30,000 Daltons. Uh, and this was the beginning of the molecular biology of prions. And I'm coming back to this slide I showed you before, because when you looked, when I looked at this uh, EM preparation, it reminded me of what I had been paging through the night before, a few days before, 
looking at amyloids and looking at the electron microscopy of amyloids. There was a whole book on this. And I said, oh my God, this looks like what I'm looking at all the time. So the question was, is this truly an amyloid? And I, I was looking at this with Robley Williams, who was recently a retired professor of virology at UC Berkeley, and who was a very famous person because he had created rotary shadowing of viruses, a whole technique, and uh, you could then measure the size of the virus. And Robley, Robley often remarked, I don't know what these rods are, but when we see them in every purified preparation, we need to think about them. They don't look like a virus, at least one that I have ever seen. This is Robley talking now. There are no viruses in my atlas uh, that look like these rods, each of which looks slightly different. All poliovirus look the same and are different from COVID-19. Well, there was no COVID-19 when he was there, but I'm just using that as an example. Uh, and then he says, it's great. All of these guys at the virus lab uh, who thought that I was crazy to spend so much time working with you, now they think you're onto something important. And he was so proud of this. Well, with George Glenner, Mike McKinley and I flew to UC San Diego, or to San Diego, I should say, rented a car and drove over to the university and George Glenner was on sabbatical there. And I remember him when he stained the preparations with, uh, on a slide with uh, Congo red dye, it was red. Well, okay, that's what he expected. But when he looked under the polarizing light microscope, what he found was that the preparations were largely green and when he rotated at 45 degrees, they became gold. And then when he rotated another 45 degrees, they returned to the green. And this was really diagnostic of amyloids. So putting together the electron microscopy and the uh, staining properties, uh, we became quite convinced that these were amyloids. Now that opened up a whole new world. And let me just kind of show you how to think about this in a cartoon. So the amino acids with hydrophobic side chains are the ones with red, and the blue ones are either neutral or they're water soluble. They're, the, they're, at, they're blue, so they're all mixed up. But then when they start to fold these proteins, they then, if, if there's a lot of the red, they try very hard to internalize the red within the structure of the protein. And that internalization, because about 40% of amino acids have hydrophobic side chains, and eventually they assemble into things like amyloids right here. And you see that the red residues are internalized and the blue ones are on the outside. So in 1974, when I really began all of this work, uh, this is the state of neurodegenerative diseases. They're all in a wastebasket. Here's Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, here's ALS, called Lou Gehrig's disease very often, Parkinson's disease, MS, and Alzheimer's disease. And except for multiple sclerosis, which is a disease that is an inflammatory disease, these other diseases turn out to be prion diseases. The biggest and most uh, well studied of these diseases uh, is Alzheimer's disease. And it's 1906 when uh, Alois Alzheimer uh, discovers the disease. He had watched a patient, a 56 year old woman, gradually lose her memory over five years. At autopsy, he saw a shrunken brain, and microscopically, he found numerous plaques and tangles. This was the first description of Alzheimer's disease. In 1984, the A-beta peptide was discovered by George Glenner, who I already mentioned, uh, and the next year was shown to be present in plaques. In 1985, the 
tau protein was found in neurofibrillary tangles. So Alzheimer's disease looks like this on the upper left. This is the normal brain, and here's the shrunken brain of a patient with Alzheimer's disease. And microscopically, we see two kinds of deposits. We see these neurofibrillary tangles, and we see these plaques, these big collections of, at that point, junk, because at that point, the, 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 uh, the neurons stop working. Now, this is a slide from Maria Spilantini and Michelle Godert. Uh, and what you see uh, in this slide are different, different tangles. These are all tau, but different deposits of tau in different diseases. So here's Alzheimer's disease at the top left, top left shown here, and then chronic traumatic encephalopathy in the middle panel in the upper row. And then PIX disease, these little deposits that are intracellular or just next to uh, the cell. And there's progressive supranuclear palsy. And you see lots of little fibers and occasionally intense staining. And then many more fibers. And then out to the right, cortical basal degeneration. Now, the tangles are made of tau. And tau is a very complex protein. It has between around 400 amino acids. And that makes it big and difficult to work with. But even worse is that there are six different isoforms created by alternative splicing. And here you see many, many different uh, point mutations, all of which cause uh, uh, neurodegenerative diseases. Now, contrast that with alpha-synuclein, which is the cause of Parkinson's disease. And you see that there are only five sites that are mutated that we know about. Um, and there's some different mutations here at A53, A53T, E, and V, and these are just single amino acid substitutions. Each one of can cause a, a familial form of Parkinson's disease or a similar disease. But over here, you see, we've got an enormous number of possibilities. So, and here we have all these different isoforms we have to deal with. So if you wanna make a drug, I'm, Tau is really not a great place to start. It's very difficult. Um, whereas alpha-synuclein is an equally important disease and looks like it's going to be a lot easier. And that's how it's turning out to be. Now, in Alzheimer's disease, uh, this is Carlo Candelo and Atsushi Oyagi. And what we did, along with Bill DeGrotto, was we said, let's see if we can take our prion assays and look very carefully for prion infectivity. And we focused on Alzheimer's disease. This is all published a few years ago. Uh, and if you look over here to the left, you see that the control shows no tau prions and a small, very small signal with a beta. Now, with sporadic Alzheimer's disease, you see that all of these are positive. And almost every one of these with tau, there's a couple at the bottom. And what happens in very late cases of, of Alzheimer's disease, the tau prion infectivity becomes very difficult to measure. The familial cases, and people die much younger with the familial forms of these diseases, uh, both, familial, uh, both of these are familial Alzheimer's disease, but the diff different mutations. Uh, we see positives in every single sample and every single sample. And the same is true out here in this pre form of mutation. So we have uh, clear evidence that all of these are prions. So all of these, the, both of these proteins in these diseases form uh, 
prions and the prions themselves then become the culprits and eventually the patients uh, succumb to different forms of Alzheimer's disease. Now, let's skip really fast. We're gonna go backwards and forwards with Parkinson's disease. So the disease is first described in 1817 by James Parkinson in a really beautiful monograph. And it was called Shaking Palsy Paralysis Agitans. Uh, in 1912, uh, Fritz Louis identified eosinophilic neuronal inclusions in Parkinson's disease that are insoluble in alcohol, chloroform, and benzene. In 1997, mutations in the uh, synuclein gene were found to cause familial Parkinson's disease, and alpha synuclein fibrils were found in Lewy bodies. Currently, there are over 10 million people worldwide with Parkinson's, and in the United States, about one and a half million. There's several drugs. Uh, they don't work well, but they work a little bit. And in the beginning, they're much more effective than later. But over time, the disease worsens and the patients become resistant to the drugs. And alpha-synuclein prions are the cause of Parkinson's and other forms of the disease. Now, I'm not gonna talk a lot about Parkinson's, but I'm gonna show you just a little data in this slide and the next one. So it, this is worked by lots of different people who've discovered these point mutations in the synuclein gene. And here are three of them that are shown, uh, A30P, E46K, and A53T. And these point mutations are shown here, but now one is in red, the E46K because the e, when you express E46K uh, in cultured cells, it prevents the, the propagation of prions, of synuclein prions. This is a dominant negative, and I'm gonna show you more about that in the next slide, which has allowed us to distinguish between uh, three different diseases. So multiple system atrophy shown in red here, uh, dementia with Lewy bodies shown in purple, and in green, uh, it's shown uh, Parkinson's disease. Now in the assay that I'm showing you, we can't measure Parkinson's disease by this assay. This is a cell culture assay. And you can see that MSA prions multiply in cultured cells, and we get a very big signal. That's the red bar. But with the E46K mutation present, it completely obliterates the uh, in infectivity. So now the synuclein prions are essentially zero. But when we look at people with dementia with Lewy bodies, which is a distinct disease neuropathologically from uh, from Parkinson's, what we find is that the E46K mutation does nothing. So we completely, we, we are able to distinguish this from MSA and we can distinguish this from, from, uh, from Parkinson's disease. So we, for the first time we have an assay that we can really use that's biological, we get a measurement. Uh, and secondly, what we see is that the dominant negative disappears. First, it's present here because E46K kills the infectivity, but here its, it's activity is completely uh, absent. So that we, infectivity now is the same with or without the E46K mutation. And this is all published in a paper earlier this year and what's really important about this is that it shows you that these proteins are different in these different forms of, of what we call Parkinson's disease. But Parkinson's disease is classical Parkinson's disease. And that's shown over here in the green bars. This of course is dementia with Lewy bodies. And here we have uh, multiple system atrophy. So for the first time we can see that these prions are different and 
that's really the key to advancing uh, trying to make drugs that are effective. So let me just summarize where we are. Uh, we'll bring this to a close. Um, so what happens? What happens is the, that we start with a normal protein. And because of, it, because of exposure, uh, uh, because of, of a mutation, or because over time, the protein misfolds and more and more of the protein is misfolded and it becomes a clump. And then more and more of it's made and so we get these different strains and they can be propagated and eventually the chi accumulation causes the disease and kills the patient. If we look at kind of an overview of prion biology, there are an enormous number of prions now to study. There are prion diseases that are caused by the proteins that become prions. Uh, but we can say that here's a whole group of different diseases by, by PRP prions. And we have sheep and cows and deer uh, and elk, and we have humans. Uh, with tau, we have a lot of different diseases that I've shown you and talked about them, so I won't repeat that. With A beta, stim A breed of prions stimulating tau to become a prion, that's true with Alzheimer's disease and now trisomy 21 Down syndrome. That's very clear now. And with alpha synuclein, uh, we have Parkinson's disease, I just went over these, dementia with Lewy bodies, and multiple system atrophy. And then what about functional prions? Well, there are, Eric Kandel has worked for a long time on this problem uh, and showing that this protein controls RNA synthesis in memory. And then there's another form of memory, innate immunity, and then many, many different fungal proteins are, and this is work, work, work of Reed Wickner and many others. So let me kind of begin to close and talk about for a moment a whole new approach to, to this problem of prions and how do we make medicines. And this is a slide by Dan Southworth in San Francisco. And what he's showing you is that when you do a purification and make Pure, highly purified preparations, you can eventually get crystals. And these crystals, when you look at them by electron microscopy, you can see that they have these fibers inside. And this is X-ray crystallography. And the X-ray gives you a high resolution structure, but the structure is non-biological. And this new technique of cryo-electron microscopy has revolutionized, especially the studies of proteins that, are, that form insoluble fibers. But that's exactly what we have in neurodegenerative diseases. And it's these three men shown here uh, who received the Nobel Prize in 2017, it's five years ago, who created a revolution. And now you see every week more and more papers using cryo-electron microscopy to open up new avenues of investigation. And let me just show you one. This comes from the work of Godert and Shares at the MRC at Cambridge. Uh, and this is Greg Murs who looked at this very carefully. And when you do that, you can find these regions in which the protein is folded differently. So this is the Alzheimer's filament and then the CTE filament uh, made of tau. And you see over here, this, these two residues. So these are residues uh, that lie between 349 and 362. And you see the opposition of a lysine and a serine. But if you look over here, that, those same, that same amino acid sequence, here's the lysine, but now, the serine is way out here and it's twisted and now there's a leucine here. So these subtle changes end up creating very different structures. Well, 
this is this this is almost too much to imagine. It's just extraordinary what's come out of the MRC at Cambridge, looking at all of these different dementias. Uh, and what you can see is that they're all folded slightly differently. And these are really name tags uh, that are opening up a whole new biology. So I'm going to just end with this slide and the next one. And I want to make sure that everybody understands that it's much better to be lucky in life than brilliant. Uh, because prions could have been unusual viruses and thus not interesting, nearly as interesting. Uh, that PRP scrapie could have been 10 to 100 times less abundant, and we would have never found it. The PRP scrapie could have been isolated 10 years earlier with no opportunity to determine the genetic origin, because only it was the re DNA, recombinant DNA technology came along as we were beginning to look at the purified protein and its origin, and that technology was crucial. Another scientist could have discovered PRP scrapie by isolating amyloid plaques or what we call scrapie associated fibrils. And they would have figured it out. And then mad cow disease came along and variant CJD, which is due to mad eating uh, BSE prions in hamburgers. And that shined the, the, the discovery of a limelight on the discovery of prions. Uh, so sometimes you get extremely lucky. That's me. And looking forward for you guys, uh, one, we, we need, we meaning the collective scientific community needs to discover effective therapeutics for treating Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, both of which are caused by prions. We need to identify diseases of unknown etiology that might be caused by prions and determine if any are caused by prions. And we need to discover physiologic processes that are presently not appreciated to be governed by prions. And we need to determine such strange thoughts need to be explored is there a role, has, has there been a role for prions in evolution? We have no understanding of this whatsoever. So there are many, many things to do. And I think that you guys need to grab this in the future and, uh, and go forward. And let me wish all of you in the Ukraine enormous amounts of good luck. I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, and let me make sure that you understand that my heart and my brain uh, and all of me is rooting for you. All the very best. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for a great lecture. It was a big pleasure for us to hear you today. Uh, it's very important, this support nowadays for us. Yeah, we have some questions and I'll begin from the first one. Uh, how high uh, is prions thermal resistant? Depends on the protein. Uh, so some of these you can boil for a while. Eventually, at high temperatures, they all unravel. But uh, yes, you can raise the temperature up. Most of these are killed by autoclaving. But, you know, it's, it's, it's the length of the autoclaving that's important. Because if you just raise the temperature for two minutes, a lot of prion infectivity survives. Right. Second one is the, uh, is a brain of an Alzheimer disease uh, patient uh, shrunk because proteins fold. Well, you could say it's it it happens because the proteins misfold, uh, and of course that pro that's the specific proteins are uh, A beta and tau, uh, and yes, that's the cause of the disease. Now, what about, what do, do the other proteins unfold, unfold, misfold? I don't know the answer to that. We've never spent a lot of time trying to investigate other proteins in an Alzheimer's brain. All right. Does the different shape of prions uh, determine the specific uh, de degenerative disease? Yes. So there are different strains. If you have, you have, you have one, one particular protein, like scrapie, and you can get different folds, slightly different folds, and you get 
different diseases. And that's true of each one that we've studied. Now, this is just at the beginning because cryo, we didn't have cryo-electron microscopy in the scrapie studies. Now we're looking at this very carefully with uh, in Parkinson's and in Alzheimer's disease. And we're seeing things just like what I showed you in the previous slide, uh, where there are all those different folds that cause these different forms of tauopathies. There were at least a dozen different ones on that slide. Uh, why prions uh, are so resistant to ultraviolet and X-ray radiation? <laughs> you know, these are, some of these are very small proteins, and uh, and they 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 seem to be able to survive this small. The target size is small. Uh, I don't I don't think anybody knows exactly why one protein of the same size is is more resistant or less resistant uh, to uh, radiation. Uh, I can't tell you that. All right. Uh, some uh, our participants asking about um, literature uh, about prions. Uh, could you recommend something to our participants uh, they can find in the internet or uh, do you know some books about it? Well, I showed you one book that I wrote. It's accurate, uh, but it's old now. It's it's eight years old, uh, and I don't know of another book that's recent. So I can't recommend that, but there is an enormous literature out there that is growing and growing by the day, uh, and you just have to look through the through the journals through the internet, and uh, and you can find all of this. How some nucleons uh, structure like uh, LE proteins? I'm not sure what I'm not sure what LE proteins are. L I don't know how to answer this. I don't understand it. Uh, I guess LEA proteins. Maybe I, I yeah, I don't know the answer. I, I... All right. Uh, on what are you uh, working right now? Some projects or you are just uh, like a teacher in school or you're still in a laboratory doing some experiments and something like that? No, no, I'm working very hard with young young people, and we're working on developing drugs. That's where our focus is. Um, all right, thank you. And um, maybe uh, do you have any programs for like uh, to join about? Maybe it will be interesting for our uh, participants to listen about your uh, uh, your university and your uh, team you're working with. I'm sorry, I didn't understand them. I didn't understand what you said. What What do they want to know about the team of people? Uh, about your team you're working with, uh, about uh, how, how to join probably and like that. I see, I see. Well, then you have to write me an email. Send me an email. And that you need to have a PhD or an MD degree. All right. Uh, you have to be highly trained. Uh, and the last one, um, Tell us a little bit your road to when, uh, how you became a scientist and a, a little bit about uh, probably the uh, this ceremony of uh, Nobel Prize. What, 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 what was your feeling like that? Okay, so how did I become a scientist? So I, I went to medical school because my parents kept telling me that it was a good idea. My father was an architect. He thought being a physician was much better. So my brother and I both became uh, physicians. Uh, I wandered into research. Uh, it started between the junior and senior year, the third and fourth year of college. Uh, and uh, I worked in a laboratory and the uh, director of the lab, Sidney Wolfson, was a brilliant man. He's still, he's still doing well, very well in his 90s. Uh, and uh, he, he really taught me to think about things in science, and it became immediately fun. It was exciting to look at things that weren't clear and try to figure out what was going on. This was particularly with brain swelling and trauma. 
And uh, I migrated into what's called brown fat and hamsters. It's involved in, in, uh, in heat generation with a man named Britton Chance, at the, both at the University of Pennsylvania, where I was a medical student. And then I became very interested in, uh, in protein chemistry because the Vietnam War was raging and I could go to the NIH or go to Saigon or near Saigon, I should say. And uh, I chose to go to, I had, was very lucky to have the opportunity to go to the NIH and with, under a man named Earl Statman, I learned how to purify proteins. So it, this was an, a lucky evolution, uh, sort of a side hobby, but it became very, very clear that this was what I wanted to do. And I got more and more excited about problems that I was working on. And I worked on, during much of the fourth year of medical school, I went to Sweden and worked with a man named Ulla Lindberg. And uh, we worked on this problem together. And uh, it, was, it was great. It was, so all of these things just kind of converged. And uh, this was never a formal course in science. It wasn't as though I got a PhD. Uh, but... Uh, having an MD turned out to be sufficient. And what about, what about a Nobel Prize? So everybody thinks about a Nobel Prize who's a scientist at some point or another. Smart people don't sit there and become dreamers that, you know, this is going to happen, this is going to happen, and why is it going to happen now, and spend their life worrying about it. You got to put it out of your mind and not think about it. And if it happens, it's great. It's better than great, it's phenomenal, uh, but you don't want to focus on this because it becomes overwhelming and you're not in charge. And luck is a big part of this. And I think, you know, it's, it's, it's crucial. And I have a lot, of, a lot of friends who say, oh, you know, I should have done this or I should have done that. And they spend their life being annoyed, unhappy that they didn't win a Nobel Prize uh, or hoping that they will someday, but, I think it's it's really important not to focus on this. Uh, it's great if it happens. It's phenomenal. It's really fun, and uh, the whole process. It's just it, it's something very special. But I think you know you can't you just can't focus on it too much because you're not in charge. People in Sweden are in charge, and luck is in charge. Uh, I don't know what else to say about that. Thank you. Thank you very much for a great lecture. It was a big pleasure for us. Um, I hope that very soon, like, it will be peace in our country. And uh, I would like to invite you here to, to make an in-person lecture, maybe some uh, to visit some of our universities. And we have a great, uh, great uh, museum, the science museum. I hope that uh, that that that's possible in very very soon well i hope so too and i assure you that i will come i have been my the, my my grandfather on my paternal side uh grew up uh in moscow and but uh was born along the Dnieper river in uh, belarus and so just to the north a little bit uh so I've been there. Uh, I've not been to the Ukraine and I would love to go to the Ukraine and I'm keeping my fingers crossed that this can get settled and, uh, and that Ukraine can continue to thrive. And uh, all of my good wishes and all of my caring are all for you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.